us. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. I'm going to read that, and then we'll pray, and we'll get into it together. Finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort you in the Lord Jesus, that you should abound more and more, just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that, you, that no one should take advantage or defraud his brother in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Therefore, he rejects this, does not reject man, but God, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. And Father, we pray that as we get into a very pointed and difficult section of your word, that we would, as the book of James exhorts us, receive your word with meekness, which is able to save our souls. Father, I thank you that you've invented sex. Lord, you're the one who creates human, who's created human sexuality. It's your idea. And Lord, you know how best it should be used, and you know why you've made it in the first place. And so, Father, we want to come to you and with humility. We want to say, God, show us. Show us in our brokenness how we, walk, how we can walk in this. We pray you would fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit. That you might have the power to live a sanctified life, one set apart for you. For we pray it in Jesus' name. And everyone who agrees says, Amen. Amen. So, I want to introduce to you... Uh, introduce you to seven people. Seven people that I know, that I've had the experience of, of knowing within ministry. Uh, with the exception of Sam here, whose name is really Sam, the rest of these are just uh, made up names. I've kind of changed the name, sometimes even changed the gender, so that nobody feels like I'm talking about them. So if you are named one of these things, I'm not talking about you necessarily. <laughs> But, but I'm doing this because it's important as we talk about this issue of sexuality that we remember that we are talking about people. And these are all people that I've had the blessing of having experience with. And I want to give you a little a bit of each of their story. Sam is a vicar who has same-sex attractions. He's attracted exclusively to men. And Sam has des desired or decided to be a celibate, that is, he's having no sexual relations with anybody. And Sam's serving God, he's used, being used by God greatly, and he enjoys many, many loving relationships, just not romantic ones. This is Angie. Angie was raped by her grandfather as a little girl. And you can imagine her disgust towards male sexuality. Because of that, she felt that she wanted to only be involved with women. So she had many lesbian relationships up until her late teens. And then Angie became a Christian. Oh, yeah. She started to follow Jesus. And so she started to date Christian men. And even though she didn't get sexually involved, she kind of is wondering, should I have ever actually done that? Should I ever really think about dating a man? And she's not sure what she's going to do with her life. This is Peter. Peter's a committed husband and father. Uh, he loves his family. But Peter has not been intimate with his wife for over two years, mainly because since the birth of their last child, their wife, her wife, his wife's not interested anymore. And he's used that as an excuse to fall back into this pattern, this habit of pornography that he had as a young man. This is Fiona. Now, Fiona really loves Jesus. She really wants to follow him, but Fiona has a secret that nobody else really knows about, and she's overwhelmed with guilt. You see, Fiona's been involved with online sex with older men, and she's so ashamed that she feels like she can't tell anybody, and at this point, she's suicidal. This is Nigel. 
Nigel uh, is a new believer. He's just come to know Christ, and, uh, and he has a girlfriend who's not a believer, and he feels a little bit guilty because they're sexually active, but he also feels like, well, the best way he can show her God's love is just to be the best boyfriend possible. Th this is Jessica. Jessica grew up in the church. Uh, she's been sexually attracted to both men and women since basically puberty. She's had some committed uh, Christian boyfriends, and she's thought, okay, maybe I'll be okay. I'll, I'll find a guy, and we'll get married, and I won't really worry about my attraction to women. But then what happened is she fell in love with a woman, or with a woman, and she left her church. And now she's convinced that you can be in a gay relationship and still follow Jesus. This is Robert. Robert was raised in the church, felt guilty as he started to begin to feel... Uh, sexual attraction towards the same sex, towards other men. And so he tried to, as he said, pray the gay away. He tried to pray until he just didn't have those feelings anymore, but he still felt, still feels tempted. And feeling that way, he feels like he can't tell anybody about it, so he really, at least not in his church, and so he really struggles with depression. Now all seven of these people, and there could have been many more, I could have, I could have talked about the, the, the teenager who, who feels like they're not attracted to anybody sexually and wonders what's wrong with them. I could have talked about um, the, the myriads of young men and women that I meet that have a problem with pornography and older men and women who have a problem with pornography. These are just seven, but these are seven real people. As I said, I've changed their name, sometimes the gender, but they're seven real people and there's probably many people, even here today, who would feel like they fit in one of these categories. And it's really important for us to recognize that, that all seven of these people have something in common with each other and with all of us. They have many things in common. One is they're all made in the image of God. They're all image bearers of God and so they all have inherent value. The other is they're all broken. They're all fallen. They're all sinful like us and that brokenness has affected their sexuality like it has ours. They're all people for whom Christ died. And in this case, these seven are all people who are part of or have been part of a local church. I'm saying this because as we talk about what we're going to talk about today in 1 Thessalonians chapter 8, it's important for us to... to to see what the scripture says about these things. And if we are going to be Jesus followers, that we have open conversation about these things. That we are a group of people, that we're a family where we can talk about these things. Interesting, because in this section you have Paul beginning to say, okay, he's, he's been praising this church in Thessalonica. He's been talking about the, the, the great faith they have in the midst of persecution. And he gets to the point where after praising them and thanking God for what he's done in them, he's saying, okay, now let me encourage you, even in the midst of the difficulties, to press on with God, to keep moving towards this term he uses, sanctification. Keep moving towards sanctification. And the issue he brings up, the specific issue he brings up, is this issue of sexuality. It's interesting. It's interesting and it's difficult to talk about. It's difficult because this is a very emotive issue, isn't it? Especially in our day and age. It's something that we don't want to talk about. It's something that we can be quite hypocritical about. I've, I've talked to many Christians who will, who will speak with disgust about so-and-so's sexual temptation and yet kind of wink their eye at their own sexual temptation. It's difficult because we're not sure how we should deal with these kinds of things. We're, we're wondering if we're handling these things right, rightly. It's difficult because if we stick, as we'll see today, if we stick to the biblical standard, we're on the wrong side of culture. And then it makes us feel even more marginalized and difficult to have relationships with people. But it's really important for us to understand that being a Jesus follower, following Christ, means that we're called to a distinct expression of human sexuality. That God calls us to a standard that He intends to point people back to Him with. 
So let's get into it. Let's, let's talk about how this works, at least according to what Paul's saying here in 1 Thessalonians. I want to give you three main things to think about, about what we mean by sanctified sexuality. First of all, we, we need to understand that it's God's love that defines His moral authority. All right? God's love defines His moral authority. Now, what, what do I mean by that? What do we need, mean by moral or morality? Morality is really just a, a way to say how things should be. All of us are moral beings. It's one of the things that makes us human. It's one of the things that, that separates us from the animal kingdom. It's one of the things that really we see as part of being made in the image of God. We're moral beings. We have a sense of how things should be. Now, we might not agree on morality, but we are moral beings. So when we talk about moral, we mean that. How things should be. When we talk about authority, we mean what or who defines how things should be. So that when we're, we're talking about God's love defines his, or, or, yeah, defines his moral authority, we're saying, okay, when we talk about what God's standards are, we need to understand this in the context of who God's revealed himself to be as the God of love. That, that the standards that he sets for us, including the sexual standards, those standards are wrapped up and they're not separate from who he is, this God of love, this three in one. Now, we read in verse 1, it says, Paul says, Finally, my brothers, it might better be said, And now, my brethren, we urge and exhort you in the Lord Jesus Christ that you should abound more and more, just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God. So now he had said earlier, we saw Mike talk about this a bit earlier, he had said in verse 12 of chapter 3, he said, May the Lord increase you and make you abound in love to one another and to all just as we do to you. And so he's saying, look, my, our prayer for you as the, the church in Thessalonians is that you would continue to grow in love. You continue to abound, abound in love. And in doing so, you would learn to or grow in your ability to live your life. That's what the word walk means, to live your life. To live your life in a way that's actually pleasing to God. Well, why would we want to please God? Well, the scripture is really clear. We want to please God because He loves us. It's God's love for us that motiva motivates our desire to please Him. Now, Scripture teaches really plainly that it's God who has provided for, initiated, and sustains His love for us. We're not earning love from God. It's God who already loves us. Listen to this. The Scripture says in 1, Thessalon I'm sorry, 1 John chapter 4, uh, verse 10, and then in verse 19 it says, In this is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Propitiation is a fancy word that means that which satisfies judgment. Jesus was that, that sacrifice that satisfied God's judgment. In verse 19 it says, We love Him because He first loved us. So He's the one who's provided for us to know His love through the death of Christ. He's the one who's initiated this loving relationship. He always is the one who does this. And then we read in Romans chapter 8, this is what Paul says. Paul says, I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul says, nothing can break that love once we're in Christ. That love is ours. It's permanent. He sustains it. So we know enough about relationships as human beings to know relationships take effort. They take maintenance, don't they? But the thing is, sometimes we've had relationships that were a bit, well, they were off kilter. We had to earn the other person's love. You may have had parents that made you feel that way. You're not acceptable or loved unless you live at a certain level. That's a hard thing to live under. That's not the gospel. That's not the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is not the love that God offers to us in Jesus. He offers to us in Jesus a perfect love, a perfect acceptance. He meets us right where we are. And we need to understand this. Because when we're talking about God's love defining His moral authority, we need to know we're never going to be motivated to say, okay, God, I want to learn to live in that authority. I want to learn to, 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 to live by your standards. Unless we actually believe that God loves us the way He says He does. We have to believe this. 
In fact, the more we believe this, the more we realize, I don't want to live for myself anymore. Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Paul writes, For Christ's love compels us, because we're convinced that one, one died for all, that's Jesus died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised from the dead. Or raised again. This is the thing you have to understand. What the scripture is teaching here is that the love that God has for us, the love that God is and has always had and makes available to us in Christ, there is no greater love. All other loves that we desire or that we experience, all those loves are simply something to point past us into the love that we're going to experience in its fullness when we see God face to face. And so what Paul says here in 2 Corinthians is, okay, you don't need to learn you to love yourself. <laughs> you need to learn to know God's love for you. In fact, you need to stop living for yourself. And know that the greatest love you can experience is the love that God has for you. Therefore, let, his, let your love for Him be paramount. Now, in verse 2, Paul says this. He says, For you know what commandments we gave to you through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul's, Paul's saying, look, these things that we've told you before that I'm writing to you about again, we told you these things in the authority of Jesus. And so we came in Jesus' authority. We're telling you as if Jesus is telling you these things directly. This is what Paul's saying. Now you can disagree with Paul if you want to. That's, that is obviously your choice. But we can't deny Paul is saying he is speaking or they as apostles spoke and came in the very authority of Jesus Christ himself. Now what authority is that? Well, here's what we know. We know that God's love is accessed through the authority of Jesus. We see the authority of Jesus. is really Jesus really demonstrating the very authority of God. One example is in Mark's Gospel. In Mark chapter 2, you guys remember the story? There's a there paralyzed man. He can't get to Jesus to try to get healed. So his four friends carry him to Jesus. And they, they still can't get to him because the house where Jesus is is so crowded. So they go on top of the flat roof. They tear the roof off. And they lower him down to Jesus. You guys remember that story? And as they lower the, this paralyzed man down to Jesus, what does Jesus say? He says, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven. And all the religious guys are going, can't do that. You can't, who are you? What are you, God, you can forgive sins now? He is. And so Jesus says this in Matthew, in Mark chapter 2, verse 10. I think I have it here. If not, basically what he says to, him, what he says to them is, um, he says, so that you may believe... I thought I had it here. I'm really sorry. Yes, it is. There it is. There it is. He says, so that you may believe, I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins on earth. And then he heals the guy. Because then he says, look, if, if I can heal this guy who's been not able to walk, probably from birth, you can know that I have the authority. If I show the authority of God over sickness, you can know I have the authority of God to forgive sins. So Jesus, as you, if you look at the Gospels, especially if you read Mark's Gospel, you see that Jesus operated demonstrating the very authority of God over everything, over creation, over sin, over sickness, over death, over evil spirits, everything. So this is important because when Paul comes and says, hey, we came to you in the authority of Christ, he's saying, you know, Christ came in the authority of God, we're coming in the authority of Christ, so we're speaking to God about, we're speaking to you from God about this stuff. And when Jesus talks about his authority, here's how he commands. He sums up all his commands to his disciples in John 13. He says, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you, so you also love one another. By this all will know that you're my disciples if you have loved one another. And so Jesus says, look, I've come in the authority of God. I'm giving you the command of God. And the, 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 the way you sum up all the commands of God is to say, you need to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And you need to love people the way I loved you. I want you to love each other that way. This is what we mean when we say... God's love is access through the authority of Jesus. We recognize what God means by Him, His love that He is and His love that He has by how we see Jesus living. How we see Jesus commanding those who say they want to follow Him. That's what His authority looks like. It's eternal and loving. 
Now, this is important because we're talking about God's love defining his moral authority. We're talking about the fact that God is setting a, an absolute standard to what, how, how human sexuality is to be used. And we need to see this comes from his love. And therefore, we need to see if we reject this, we're actually rejecting his love. If you drop down the verse 8, what did Paul say? He said, therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God who has given us his Holy Spirit. So this is what Paul says. We, we, again, you can choose to reject this or not accept it. That's fine. But you cannot deny that Paul is saying, I am speaking to you from the authority of God. This is God's will for human sexuality. We have to understand this. Now, so God's love defines His moral authority. That's the first thing I want you to see. But also, let's look at verse 3. Because we need to recognize that God's people are destined to become like God's Son. There's a bigger picture than just what your life is like for the 70, 80, 90 years that you live on this earth. God has a greater destiny for us than that. He says in verse 3, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. Sanctification. That is a big word. Sanctification. Who used that in conversation this week? Sanctification. It's a very Christian word. It's a churchy word, isn't it? It's interesting that the word sanctification that's translated sanctification here, it's also translated often holiness. It's used ten times in the New Testament, three of those times right in this section. So sanctification or holiness, it really what it has to do with, it has to do with the fact that 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 God has set us apart and God is also setting us apart for His purpose. So the word sanctification or the word holiness refers to a position that we have before God as Jesus followers, as those who put their faith in Christ. He declares us holy or sanctified, past tense. But it's also a process by which He's changing us to make us like Jesus. This is what sanctification is. He's making us like Jesus. And it's really important for us to recognize that it's not an option for us as Jesus followers. It's not as if we can go, okay, I, I know I need forgiveness, and man, I love this idea of the love that God has for us, so I've received Christ as my Savior. I'm excited about Jesus. I love to praise God at church. It's cool to be in this community. But, you know, learning to be like Jesus, well, we'll see. Maybe that'll happen once I get to heaven. Not, it's, it's kind of an optional thing. Really spiritual people do that. But you know, most of us, we're going to just kind of coast right in. But actually, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that this process of sanctification isn't an option. Listen to this. Romans chapter 8, verses 28 and 29. Right? Romans 8, 28 and 29. It says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. What's His purpose? Listen. For those, who, those God foreknew, He also, notice, predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be, that's Jesus might be, the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And so in Romans chapter 8, the same chapter that we just read earlier where God's trying to show us there's nothing that can separate us from His love. He also tells us, this is your destiny. If you're a Jesus follower, your destiny is to be made like Jesus. Sanctification is the process that gets you there. Christ's death on the cross is provided all that you need to get there. But sanctification is this process where, where God, by His Holy Spirit, through His people, is applying that finished work of God to your life to make you like Jesus. Why? Because when we are made like Jesus, we're able to enjoy God forever. See, one of the reasons we get so tripped up with human sexuality is that we've bought, and I, and I say we on purpose, we have bought into this lie that human sex, sex between, sex in a loving relationship, is the highest order of love we can find. That's a lie. It's just not true. It's not why you were created. God created sex. It is awesome. It is powerful. It is a blessing when you're allowed to enjoy it. But it's not the ultimate. It's simply a pointer to what God has planned for us. The intimacy that you can experience in, in a relationship, 
physically. That intimacy, even when it's exactly the way God intended it to be, is still not the ultimate. It points to something greater. It points to an intimacy that we're going to enjoy with God forever. Now don't get weirded out. I'm not talking about sex with God. That's weird. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about, I'm talking about a connection that we kind of only get a, a taste of occasionally. Something that we're longing to see happen. And so th this is what Paul's saying. Paul's saying your destiny is to be made like Jesus so like Jesus you can enjoy God forever. Guys, no one gets in the presence of God and says, you know how much are you? There's only two responses when you get in the presence of God. One is to go, oh no, hide me, I'm dead. Mm. And the other is to say, oh Lord, no one is worthy like you. And we have all eternity to get to know him better and better and better. And we'll be doing that together and it's going to be glorious. It's the world that we actually all want, even if we can't describe it. This is our destiny. Listen to this, Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 says this, Make every effort to live at peace with everyone and be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Holiness, sanctification, not an option. Peter says a similar thing. You have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with His blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Can you see the, the, the conclusion here? Can you see that Paul and the author of Hebrews and Peter all say the same thing? You're being set apart for God's purposes. You going through the process to be made like Jesus is not an option if you're a Jesus follower. If you don't want to follow Jesus, that's a whole other issue. But if we're going to follow Jesus, we need to know this is what it's for. This is what he's doing. He's changing us. He's doing this radical, supernatural transformation. This process. So that one day we can enjoy God forever. Those of you who are in that process, you, you're, this excites you. Those of you who have tasted and seen the goodness of God, even though you fall radically short still, you've tasted how good God is and you go, oh, well, I want that so bad. This is what God has for us. So Paul is saying, listen, he's saying you need to understand when it comes to your sexuality, this is the process that God's going to do to make you like Jesus. Now this is important because we need to recognize, okay, that Jesus, listen, is the only human who wasn't sexually broken. Mm. He's the only one. All, all my friends here that we've listed, sexually broken. All of you and me, sexually broken. But Jesus wasn't. Now, that's important for a couple reasons. One, it tells us this is what God's going to conform us into. One day we're not going to be sexually broken anymore. But also it tells us it's not our unbrokenness becoming unbroken that makes us acceptable to God. It's His perfect unbrokenness that makes us acceptable to God. You know what that means? That means as you're struggling with your sexual brokenness, you know what that means? You can still know that the one who represents you in heaven is perfectly unbroken. Mm. Come on. But also it's important for us to see this is the fact that this is what God's calling us to. In fact, this word sexual immorality, it's two words in English. It's one word in the Greek language. It's the Greek word pornea. It's where we get the English word pornography. And basically, it boils down to any other kind of sexual activity out, outside the, God's guidelines, outside what God says how sex is supposed to be used. Now, we'll talk about what that is in a second. But I want you to, to understand something, okay? That Jesus, of course, was never married. He's going to be married to us, but he's not been married yet. He's engaged to us. But he's never been, he was, was a single man his whole life, okay? His singleness is not what made him sexually pure. That was just the calling that God had on the human Jesus as he walked this earth, okay? But it also shows us, listen, that singleness, celibacy, can be a beautiful expression of human sexuality. That actually not having sex can be a beautiful expression of human sexuality. It can open the door for other things. 
This is why Paul says what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Paul talking about his own singleness. This is what he says. The Apostle Paul writes, But I wish everyone were single just as I am, yet each person has a special gift from God of one kind or another. In other words, singleness or marriage. He says, So I say to those who aren't married and to widows, it's better to stay unmarried just as I am. Now, now, this is hard. It's really hard to hear this, especially if you're a single person who wants to get married. Well, it's easy for you to say, John, you're married. And your wife rocks. Yes, she does. <laughs> Amen. It's easy. It is, in one sense, easy for me to say, in one sense. But after almost 28 years of marriage, Sarah and I will both tell you, sometimes singleness sounds like a good option. <laughs> not all. Hey, here's the reality. Paul's not saying... Um, Paul's not saying it's wrong to be married. He's saying it's great to be single. In God's kingdom, in God's economy, falling after God's plan, there's, a, there's something great about being single. So you, most of you aren't called to be single, but some of you are called to be single. But until you're married, guess what? You're all called to be single. <laughs> and there's something beautiful, there's something Christ-like about that singleness. I think one of the reasons we struggle to deal with sexuality in the church is because we so ex exalted sex in marriage. Either we just say it's some holy thing that we never talk about, so nobody ever wants to admit if their sex life is going pear-shaped. Nobody ever wants to talk about this. Or we think, I'll finally be happy when I get married and I can have sex. Girls often will say, more often than men, girls will say, when I'm finally close to somebody, because they're more polite, guys will say, when I finally can have sex, then I'll be happy. No, you won't. You won't. Now, those were generic terms. Sometimes it's swapped, just to be clear. The reality is this. God has destined us for something greater than sex. This is not me downplaying sex. I have five kids for a reason. <laughs> I'm not downplaying sex, okay? It's a beautiful, great thing in marriage. But here's what I'm saying to you. It's not the ultimate. Your sexuality is not the ultimate. And it's definitely not the only thing that identifies you. You need to know that. It's not the only thing that identifies you. Now, we also need to see that Jesus is this great high priest that understands our struggles. It says in, um, in the book of Hebrews, where did I put that? In Hebrews 4.15 it says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. There's theological debate about Jesus' sexuality. I mean, some people want to say that Jesus was asexual. Um, I, my personal conviction is, because he was made human and as a man, that he had a normal male sex drive. He was a, we know he's perfect. He didn't have indwelling sin like we do. Um, so my personal conviction is he would have physically had a desire for marriage, but he chose to obey the Father and not, and not be married. That's my conviction. It's not a, a major issue. You can disagree with me. But, but the reason I'm saying that is that I, I really do believe Jesus understands sexual temptation. That he doesn't go, oh, you're disgusting for being tempted like that. That he understands. That he has compassion on us. Yet he never sinned. God's people are destined for something greater. We need to understand that if we're going to be sanctified, set apart sexually. But also, listen, we need to recognize that God's standards require some intentional application. We can't just say, okay, fine, I, I won't have sex outside of marriage. No, we need to think through these things a bit more than that. We need to wrestle through the complexity of human sexuality. Human sexuality is radically complex. Why you desire what you desire is complex. There's a myriad things that go into it. This is why we're, one size doesn't fit all. Our brokenness expresses itself in a lot of different ways. In fact, Paul says this. Notice in verse 4. Paul says in verse 4, sorry, I've got to do this again. He says that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel. That's a, a euphemism for your body, or it even could be a euphemism for uh, the sex organ, it could, or your sex organs. It could be an idea of your sexuality. He says, let each of you possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. So there's an individual application here. But he also knows, if, if you go down to verse 7, what he says. He also says in verse 7, For God did not call us to uh, us, he did not call us, to uncleanness but in holiness. In other words, we have the same calling as Jesus' followers towards sanctification. <laughs> 
So there's an individual application, an intentional individual application, depending on what kind of temptations we have, to this call to holiness sexually. In other words, my friend Sam felt called to um, celibacy. He didn't get involved in a sexual relationship. I know of other people that felt like they had exclusively uh, same-sex attractions and then they thought, okay, I'll be celibate. And then they met somebody of the opposite sex and they fell in love and thought, can this be possible? Can I actually get married? And they get married and they have a happy marriage. Oh, there's difficulties. There's things to wrestle through. Hey, there's like that in every marriage. So some are called to singleness, some are called to marriage, even in that temptation. I think about my friend uh, Robert here. And the things that he's been wrestling with. This idea, the idea that he's trying to pray the gay away and it doesn't go on. And he feels depressed. That guy, he's not going to be able to walk in sanctification unless that brother can find other brothers so he can say, could you pray with me in this and help me with this? How hard would it be? How hard is it for you to admit these things? You see, the reality is we are called to individually apply this stuff to our life, but we can't do it unless we can do it corporately. We need each other. And we're not going to be able to do this, guys, unless we can be honest with each other. Does that mean that every single person needs to stand up and say, let me be really clear about what my sexual brokenness is, and we'll do that each Sunday until everyone knows everyone's junk. No, I'm not saying that. I don't think any of us want that. But you've got to be able to tell somebody, don't you? You've got to be able to have somebody who can help you, maybe hold you accountable, pray with you, cry with you, about how difficult it is. It's, it's, I think it's important that we, we recognize this, because I think what I'm really concerned with, and this kind of brings us to this next point, is that I'm concerned with that because God's standards are so countercultural, the temptation in the church is to do one of two things. One is to say, okay, we'll just conform to the standard of the culture. Which is basically like you decide what you want to do with your sexuality. The other is to go, yuck, gross, God's clear. One man, one woman for life. Don't talk about it. Just do what you're supposed to do. That stuff shouldn't even be spoken about. I don't know that that's what the scripture teaches. Verse 5. What does it say in verse 5? In verse 5, here's what we read. Paul says, you need to be keeping your vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust, notice, like the Gentiles who do not know God. Now, Gentile means non-Jew, but it also means, in this context, non-Christian. Because the Thessalonian church was mostly Gentile, mostly non-Jewish, but, of course, they were the church. They were believers in Jesus. So this is non-Jews. So, in other words, what Paul's saying is, hey, I know you're Gentiles, and I know that your standard for sexuality is different than what the Jewish standard for sexuality is, but your standard cannot be what your standard was about sexuality before. It cannot be like everyone else in culture. It has to be different. I, I want to read you a quote from a, a New Testament theologian about... Uh, hopefully it came out. It's not there. Sorry. I should wear my glasses more often, I guess, but I'm putting things in my PowerPoint. I'll paraphrase the quote. Basically, what this New, Test New Testament uh, uh, researcher says is that if you look at first century, uh, the time of the first century, when the church was beginning, the time of Christ. In the Greek culture, it was acceptable for a married man to have sex outside of marriage with a man or a woman as long as he had a wife at home who would bear him children. We also know that it was acceptable in the first century for a wealthy Greek woman, there was different standards for different classes, but for a wealthy Greek woman, it was acceptable for her to kind of bear her husband children, but then if she wasn't being pleasured by her husband, find a woman to pleasure her. This was acceptable. This is what they did in that culture. We also know it was acceptable in that culture for the upper classes that had slaves to have sex with any of their slaves, whether they're male or female, because the slaves didn't have rights, really. Mm. 
So the standard that, that Paul's bringing forth, which we'll talk about what that is in a second, that standard that Paul's bringing forth was countercultural in the first century, in some ways more so than it is in the 21st century. And you have to understand this. You can't say, all oh, that stuff's outdated, it's antiquated, it doesn't apply to us anymore. It didn't apply to them culturally. It was countercultural. It radically changed the culture. Are you guys following me? Mm -hmm. Now, here's the, here's the thing. In, in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 15, the, the, the believers are getting together and they're debating this issue of, okay, most of us are Jewish, and so we keep the Jewish law, we keep the, the Ten Commandments, we keep the standards of God's Old Testament law, specifically the standards of sexuality, Leviticus 18. You can look up Leviticus 18 and see what those things are specifically. It sums up to sex is only acceptable between one man and one woman in marriage for life. That's, that's the standard, okay? But he, they said, okay, there's all these standards, these, all these laws in the Old Testament, and the Jewish believers in, in Jesus were going, man, we can't even keep these standards. And it's our culture. We, we can't keep making the sacrifices, and we can't keep obeying all the laws. We, we still fall short of these standards. So what, what should we do? And so they had this council because what's happening is Gentiles, non-Jews, are becoming Christians and they're going, gee, some Jewish people are saying they've got to become Jews before they can be Christians. Come on. And they're going, well, well, do they? And so they're having this debate and it really sums up with how much of the Old Testament law do Gentile Christians have to observe? How many of those laws do they have to observe? And here's what they kind of sum it up as. In 1 Corinthians 15, he says, You're to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, and from meat of strangled animals, which is basically all this has to do with not um, doing things that would actually stumble the Jews. And the Jews wouldn't eat blood, so don't eat things that would stumble the Jews. And then eating uh, food sacrificed to idols, that would stumble Gentiles, because they used to go to their temples, and they'd give their sacrifice, and then they'd do things at the temple, and then they'd have a barbecue together, basically eat the sacrifice together. And so it'd be, that's the way they worshipped their false gods. And so the idea is, don't, don't do anything that would stumble either Jews or Gentiles who aren't yet Christians. That's the idea. But then look at, look at what standard, what part of the standard of God's law still applies to Gentiles, and from sexual immorality. In other words, the Old Testament laws, Leviticus 18, that is a part of God's moral law that we as Christians are still called to follow. We have to be clear about this. Hey, don't get me wrong. It's difficult. It's difficult for us to follow this. In fact, we can't do it apart from the power of the Holy Spirit. But it still is the standard of God. It, that's why it requires intentional, intentional application. I, I think it's, it's, it's wise to say, too, at this point, that this is not just about making sure that you don't have, for lack of a better term, bad sex. You don't have sex outside of marriage between one man and one woman. It's not just about that. This also applies to the standards that the Bible talks about, marital sex. Mm. You, 1 Corinthians 7, we reference that. You read the whole thing of 1 Corinthians 7, Paul's talking about marriage, marriage and single and about sort of some principles that are important for us to understand as married people. That sex has to stop being selfish. It's got to be about blessing the other person. There's lots of applications to that. Paul says really clearly, or the author of Hebrews says really clearly in Hebrews chapter 13, that, that uh, the marriage bed is undefiled. In other words, that, that not anything goes, but there should be a freedom and an enjoyment to it. But that fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Paul talked about these guys in, in glowing terms. He loved these people. These people were wanting to follow God in the midst of some really heavy persecution, but they were still tempted. And so Paul had to say to them, look, guys, you, you still need, to, I know it's hard. You might even be thinking, this is the only release I have is to go to the, to, to have this kind of sexual f freedom, quote unquote. And Paul's going, no, it's not freedom at all. It's bondage. And you need to be sober about the consequences of continuing in this. You see, Paul's making it really clear that Christians should never encourage other Christians in unbiblical sexual practices. It's wrong. It's wrong. 
This is a salvation issue because if we refuse to walk in repentance, if we refuse to, to, to if, or maybe put it this way, if we choose our sin more than we choose God, if we choose our sin over God, there's nothing left for us but judgment. And if we pull other people into our sin, God says there's even a stricter judgment. Look, I know this is not a, a kind of a, a politically correct thing to say. I know this kind of hellfire and brimstone stuff nobody wants to hear. But here's a reality. This is what Paul's laying out for these people. He's saying you can't say you're following Jesus and continue in these lifestyles. Husbands and wives, you cannot be casual about your marriage. Men especially, because it's, it's, it's something like 60% of men who attend church regularly are, have problems with pornography. 60%. That's about 75 of us if you can't figure that out. 30% of women do. You can't, we can't mess around with this stuff. We have to say, God, you love me. You have a better plan for me. I need to turn to you and turn away from this. And stop winking at stuff that God says, no, Christ died for that. Why are you still a slave to it? It means, listen, we need to be humble and willing to help people when they are dealing with all kinds of stuff that we may not get our, be able to get our head around. Listen, the Bible talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, or chapter 10, verse 13. I think I missed this before, but you can go back to it. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says that no temptation has overcome you except such is common to man. Does that mean that everybody has same-sex attractions? No. Does that mean everyone struggles with gender identity? Absolutely not. It means that all those fit under a category of sexual brokenness and all of us struggle with our own sexual brokenness. So rather than going, well, yeah, I, I kind of struggle. I look at a girl every once in a while. It's not good. But that, what they do, oh, that's gross. No, none of that. We all need a Savior to deliver us and sanctify us. So we should be patient with each other. We should exhort one another to trust God in these things. Listen, Paul gets really practical with this in Galatians chapter 6. In Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 to 5. Paul says, Dear brothers and sisters, if anyone, if any, uh, I'm sorry, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should be gentle and humbly help that person back onto the right path. And be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Share each other's burdens and in this way obey the law of Christ, that is to love one another. He says, if you think you are too important to help somebody, or we could maybe trans that from, you think you're too busy, or you think you're too mature. If you think you're too important to help someone, you're only fooling yourself. You are not that important. Pay careful attention to your own work, for then you will get the satisfaction of a job well done, and you won't need to compare yourself to anyone else, for we are responsible uh, for we are each responsible for our own conduct. Do you see the balance there between we got to look out for each other but know that we're accountable to God? Listen, I, I want to say as, as the pastor of this church, I want to say to you, we, I believe that we as a congregation need to help each other in this. We need to start being more honest about our struggles with these things and need to be pursuing holiness together. But we also can't let the devil lie to us and say, it's not my fault that I don't want to be in church. They didn't treat me good enough. No, you're still going to stand before God for the things that you've done. No matter how bad the church has been. We have to know this. Be sober about this. I'm going to close with this scripture. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6. It's a very hopeful scripture, I think. It's sobering, but it's also hopeful. Paul says to the Corinthian church, he says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? He says, Don't be deceived. Neither fornicators, that's uh, sexually immoral, same word, pornea, nor idolaters, that's worshiping a God of your own that you make with your hands or your mind. 
Nor adulterers, that's you who are married, having sex, even fantasies about other people other than your wife or husband. Nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, that's kind of talking about the giving or receiving end of male homosexuality. Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards. We all know what thieves are. We know what drunkards are. Covetous are just, we're always wanting what we don't have. Paul puts it on the same level of sin that has to be repented of, and if not, we're being deceived. Nor revilers. That's the guys who are always negative on Facebook. It really is. Nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And notice what he says. This is the hopeful bit. And such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Hey, if you fit in any of these or in any category we've talked about, or you recognize, man, I'm in that place. I am one of these people. I am not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Guess what? We were all in that place before. And you can choose today to surrender your sin to God and receive His forgiveness and have a fresh start. That can happen today. You see, this, this sanctification, remember, it's both a position and a process. He says you were washed, past tense. You were sanctified, past tense. You were justified, that's rendered innocent, past tense. And when these things happen, when God does this for you, He starts a process that He promises to finish to make you sexually sanctified as well as sanctified in every other aspect of your life. If you're here today and, and you haven't received Christ, you haven't turned from your sin and asked Him to save you, today's the day. Why put it off? You say, well, because my life's a mess, John. You don't know how complicated. I'm like four of those things put together. It's fine. <laughs> it's not bigger than God can handle. Right. You're loved. Yeah, but I, I you know, I, I'm just not sure. I have so many questions. Hey, welcome to the club. <laughs> we still have lots of questions. You see, what it boils down to is we have to each of us choose. Initially, at one point in our life, and then daily, do we want God or do we want our sin? Each of us has to make that choice. And Father, I pray for each of us here today. Lord, I pray that you would give us the courage to turn away from the sin that so grips our hearts. Lord, we confess, God, we want our sexual brokenness. We want to express our sexuality, the way we want to express it, we confess that, Lord, that strong pull, and we confess it as sin. And we pray you'd forgive us, Lord. Forgive us, Lord, because we also confess we want you more than we want that. We believe, Lord, that you took on human flesh in Jesus, and you lived a perfect life and you died a death in our place so that our sins could be forgiven. And that you rose from the dead, guaranteeing that we can know that you're real and that you're as good as you say that you are and that one day we're going to rise from the dead, see you face to face, and enjoy you forever. We believe that, Lord. So we confess that afresh. And Father, I pray that you'd help each of us to talk to somebody today. Lord, help us to be honest with each other. To be humble. Help us to take each other to the cross of Christ where our sins are dealt with. Help us to help each other to pick up our cross and follow after you because you're worthy. Help us to believe that we are set apart positionally and that you are working that process in and through your people. Please, Lord, we pray that you would make this a reality today in everyone's life here. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.